There you go, Lee Du. Ashlan Cody Henriksen. Ashlan Danina Chusukpiak. Ashlan Nanam Chink Kinu. Hello, everyone. My name is Cody Henriksen. I am Danina and Sukpiak, and Russian and Norwegian and Danish. And I'm also an enrolled member of the Nanilchik tribe of Alaska. And I am kind of like the marine advocate for Save California Salmon, as long as the education coordinator. And this lesson came out of the abalone lessons we are giving to schools all across Humboldt County and hopefully more. You know, actually, we've even gone farther than Humboldt County already. Um, and so I'm here today to talk to you about abalone, and I'm going to touch on the history of abalone fisheries in California. I'm going to talk also about their basic ecology and just go over like anatomy, basically, between the species we have in California. I'm going to talk also about... Uh, I think I said the history, also the ecology of abalone. And then we're going to talk a little bit about threats currently facing them and efforts to reestablish them on our coastline. Now, let me share my screen with you and I will get started. All right. And forgive me, it's kind of a wordy presentation. Um, <laughs> I am a scientist. So I'm going to focus on a lot of the scientists, but I am also a um, artist who likes to work with abalone and traditional arts. So I have many connections to abalone, even though I'm native Alaskan. Where is this? Here we go. Even though I'm native Alaskan, even abalone is very important to many of our peoples as well, because what's really cool about abalone um, to native peoples, even though it's mostly found here in California and a little in Washington and Oregon, uh, abalone have been found east of the Mississippi in like beadwork, in crow beadwork. They've been found all the way to Alaska, down into Mexico. It's really amazing what abalone shows in terms of our trade and our culture and histories. So... I don't know why I'm having trouble with this presentation mode right now, but we'll just start off like this. So I already told you who I am, and I do want to talk just abalone um, are also known as the family Haliotidae. And they're mainly a temperate group, although they extend into tropical regions. And there are about 50 species recognized worldwide in rocky habitats off Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Pacific, North America, and South Africa. And there's even some in Russia. Um, here locally in California, we have seven species. Uh, historically, it was thought to be eight but now the threaded and pinto abalone are considered the same species, just different shell morphologies. In Humboldt County, where I am located today, and I'm sure, I'm sure many of you are as well, historically the species we had were red, black, pinto, and flat abalone. To this day, you'll pretty much only find red out there. There um, needs to be more extensive research to fully understand what's still in our waters, but because of anthropogenic climate change, a lot of those populations have been shifting and there's a lot of problems facing them, which we'll talk about today. Uh, I just wanted to go over some of the species with you, just give you an idea what they look like. Uh, oh. So I'm gonna start off with the red abalone. It is the largest of our abalone species and it's the one you're probably the most familiar with. Uh, they get really big and really heavy, and also because they're the largest um, of the abalone species, they were the most sought after in terms of fisheries, both for, uh, for native and non-native peoples. Uh, it's also the species that has the most mariculture interest, and um, I'm guessing mostly that's because of its size as well. 
Next up, we got the pink abalone, which is one of my personal favorites because of the shell colors. And the, it's also known as the rainbow abalone. So that can kind of give you an idea of why it's called that way. But they've got some pictures here. Um, every one of these photos will show you an inside view of the shell and an outside. It will also show you a picture of living abalone. And just to note that a lot of these living abalone you see here, um, they look very fuzzy and that is epithetic organisms and algae that are actually growing on their shell. That's not the actual organism. We have black abalone, which is a highly prized um, species, uh, mostly because of its easy access in terms of harvesting. Um, it is also ESA, in, listed as ESA endangered species, um, one of some of the only mollusks to be listed. It was the least desired in terms of commercial fisheries, um, in modern commercial fisheries, because the meat was a lot tougher. Uh, but eventually they were targeted when more prized species were subsequently taken out of the equation. Populations of black abalone are most healthy um, along the central coast, but they are found into Northern California as well. Um, but they are thought to have such low densities that they might not be able to um, successfully reproduce anymore. Uh, red abalone too, you will find across the state and is very abundant. I don't think I told you that. Next up, we have green abalone, which is generally restricted to Southern California and Baja, Mexico. The interior of the shell is very brightly iridescent and it's got a really beautiful color. Um, and so the interior is actually very prized, even though um, of like many of the abalone shells, their outside is the most kind of like plain. Uh, but with green abalone, we need population monitoring and genetic population structure information because we don't have a lot of information on that right now. Uh, there are efforts in uh, Mexico at a recovery program and cultivation of them. And there is um, talk of them coming back in higher numbers, but there is no actual studies on that yet. Next up, we have the white abalone, which is one of my personal favorite abalone stories in terms of recovery and everything. It's, I'll talk a lot about that later, but they are a very deep water um, abalone that will be in almost to like a hundred or more feet usually. Um, it was said to be the most tender of any of the abalone meats that you deem have to like pound it out to eat it. So even though their um, commercial fishery was short-lived, it really did a number on them. Uh, but there's really cool operation at mariculturing them right now to restore them back to their historical habitats. And I think that's really cool. And I'll talk a little more about that later. Next up, we have the pinto abalone, which is the Northern form um, of Haliotis camtakatkana. Forgive me for that if I said that wrong. <laughs> um, this is a really interesting species because the pinto and the threaded abalone were once thought to be different species because um, you'll see on the top here is the pinto, which is the northern form, and you'll see on the bottom the threaded, I believe the bottom left is the threaded. Oh, actually, no, it's a weird setup. It's the left two, excuse me, and the right ones are the pinto. Um, because the shell had so many differences in their morphology, they were thought to be different species for a long time, but genetic testing did reveal that they are the same species. So now instead of eight species in California, we say seven. Uh, you will find threaded in Southern California, and you will find pinto in Northern all the way into Alaska and even Russia. Flat abalone has a pretty large range in terms of cold waters. It still likes cooler water, so it's more in the northern areas of abalone on the western coast. It um, 
is a very hard abalone to actually harvest because of its smaller size and its propensity to live like really wedged into cracks. So they were never really targeted as a large commercial fishery. And I just want to show you a little bit of like what abalone looks like outside of the shell um, if you haven't seen it, because sadly, a lot of our younger generations um, don't have the opportunity to see abalone anymore because of the closed fisheries. So um, it's basically a big marine snail. The part we're really eating is going to be the the large muscle in the center of the abalone, which is the site of attachment to its shell and also to substrate so that it can attach to rocks when it's living its life. Um, and also when it's out moving around, you'll typically see a lot of tentacles like sprayed out kind of surrounding the whole circumference of the animal. Uh, obviously you won't see that when it's chopped up on this picture. <laughs> Um, and what's really cool about abalone between the species, obviously there's a lot of different distinguishments. So, but the anatomy in terms of their inside morphology is pretty similar. All right, it looks like I'm doing good on time still. Um, some of the parts I'm really excited to talk to you now about is the history of abalone fisheries in California. Let me make sure I want to get my notes pulled up because I want to make sure I get these right. Uh, <laughs> Indigenous peoples of the West Coast of the United States and Canada had intricate management practices that maintained small scale abalone fisheries since time immemorial. Um, and according to Western science's estimated period of about two millennia prior, prior to established commercial fisheries which is a pretty long time. <laughs> uh, abalone populations are predominantly controlled by top-down forces of sea otter pred predation and human fishing. So with the colonization of indigenous territories and the influx of fur trade and uh, the fur trade industry, sea otter populations crashed and we actually saw a huge uptake in the amount of abalone available because uh, we did not longer have the top-down predatory forces of uh, sea otters and also indigenous people harvesting. Um, those, what's really interesting about the history of abalone fisheries is it's very much a social issue as well, that uh, it spans more than science and culture, but there's some really interesting social structures that have gone to what the history of abalone as we know it today. As I was talking about earlier, abalone are very prized as a tool, a source of art for regalia and ceremony. Uh, they're used to make fish hooks, spoons, all sorts of things, and also highly prized as adornment for art pieces. Uh, the picture you see, oh, actually, I do want to go back to this slide. This is, here is um, a man that is a part of a white deerskin dance ceremony. And you'll see these horn-like looking things around a band or a hat on his head. Those are actually abalone pieces. So you can see how abalone is incorporated into ceremony and holds like very high um, place in the culture in cultures throughout the Americas. This picture on the left here is a of a shell midden found in um, San Nicolas Island, which is the Channel Islands. And it's mostly red abalones. But a, sh a shell midden, if you do not know, is um, usually a sacred site for native peoples uh, where they would dispose of shells, um, animal products, sometimes they would even be burial sites for dead, um, for dead relatives who have passed on. And I love this picture because this shows how much the Chumash people down there ate abalone. Because this isn't one pile, the only pile on this one island. There are numerous pile shell middens 
throughout this one island and like almost i i don't even know the actual number hundreds throughout the channel islands and all of them have like either abalone fragments or abalone shells there's also some really interesting correlations between like you'll sometimes find shell middens that are just red abalones sometimes they're just black uh i read a really cool example of one that was said to only have pink and it was also associated with a burial ground so i just think those things are really amazing and abalone were traded really um up and down the west coast throughout the americas and were found east of the uh, mississippi and to the picture on the right here is a traditional clinket rattle which is from Alaska, and the eyes are actually abalone. And although they do have abalone in their region, it is also thought that they traded for it up and down the West Coast too, because the abalone they had were much smaller, and there's evidence that they found red abalone up there. Uh, this is a really great graphic, because it kind of shows you um, the populations and how they crashed and how quickly. You do need to take in mind though, that many for many species, there's not a whole lot of data. So this is a very incomplete picture still of what we know of historic abalone populations and current abalone populations. Uh, I do wanna talk just about the fisheries for a little bit. Uh, let's go to this picture before we go back to the statistics. I think this is a really cool way to show you the abundancy of abalone um, versus modern day. The top right picture, you'll see a man who's literally has a crowbar prying off an abalone on a rock that nowadays you wouldn't find abalone on a rock like that. Like, or if you did, it, it'd be a rare, rare find. Uh, so like, and in this picture, you can see like five on one rock. And, you know, that's just one small boulder. And this is actually around Fort Bragg. I want to say, oh, and it is 1903. So this is well after fisheries have been established by, commercial fisheries have been established in California and the West Coast, and they're still this abundant. On the left here, you can also see like the abundance of them. Uh, and on the bottom right is a picture from uh, Monterey Bay and all those circular dots in that photo is abalone, which I'm guessing most likely this was probably a spawning event. They'll congregate at those points. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the history of abalone fisheries in California. Around the second half of the 18th century, uh, California saw huge migrations of people in what is now known as the California Gold Rush. Chinese immigrants were the single largest group to immigrate to San Francisco, and because of many of the racist and restrictive laws limiting Chinese investment in gold, essentially most economic endeavors for them were made illegal. So immigrants turned to commercial abalone um, harvesting as uh, a way to support themselves and their people. Numerous abalone fisheries were established uh, to take advantage of dense populations that resulted from the near extinction of sea otter populations and the attempted genocide of indigenous peoples. Using traditional skills, maritime technology, and globalized food networks, Chinese immigrants established a million dollar um, commercial industry. But after the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, Japanese Americans and Euro Americans quickly took over well established abalone fisheries and grew operations tremendously. With poor management uh, practices, no take limits, populations crashed in California in the 1990s, leading to the closure of fisheries throughout California eventually. Um, and that's where this graphic really like comes into play where you can see that. And it, on the right here, I just have a little bit timeline of abalone fisheries. And like you can, it's amazing. Uh, like in 1957, they got 54 million pounds 
Um, and but by 1969, the population was already in rapid decline. Today, we are thought to have like one percent of abalone populations because if you look here in 1996 it says four percent we've suffered many mass casualties since then and numerous threats that are facing them and um something that i like to bring up is that it really abalone fisheries in california are very much a social issue as you see you know, racism clearly played into many factors. And even when Japanese folk took over um, many like established fisheries, they also were sent to internment camps in World War II and lost a lot of their investments in that that way. And white companies then came in and took over operations. And it's actually said that when white operations came in to take over, that's when we really saw um, such large take of abalone that they say is responsible for our decline today. Um, I'm going to try to rush through a little faster because I am like getting close on my time there. I apologize. I could talk about abalone forever. Uh, I really like these graphics or pictures because they also illustrate these are um, abalone operations in California. And if you look up like abalone fisheries, you will see tons of examples of pictures like this, literal mountains of abalone shells, which today makes me cry because I find like two abalone and I'm stoked. <laughs> and I have aunties hitting me up all the time asking me for abalone and stuff. And so because um, European interest was in the meat. It was not in the shell either necessarily. And there was no sustainability practices really in play. Whereas indigenous people had systems in place that, you know, closely monitored populations and didn't, you know, overburden or over harvest them. Uh, let's, this is a really great graphic I found in a paper um, that I'd be happy to share with anyone that is about indigenous uh, management practices of abalone in Washington. Uh, look at this big section here on the left that says um, First Nations traditional use. Actually, this is from um, BC. It's from British Columbia. But if you look at like that, you have thousands of thousands of years, and that's just what's shown on this graphic of traditional, you know, um, fisheries for abalone. And then there's this tiny little point in here where you see um, the takeover of, you know, the Canadian federal government. Sea otters are then taken out around the same time a little before that. Commercial recreation uh, is established after that. And you quickly see the collapse in systems. Something also really to note about is that um, there was even a shortly managed commercial fishery by First Nations in BC, and it was actually very successful. And but they still got a lot of flack by local people when the fisheries got shut down, as they were blamed for it, as a lot of Native people will be. I'm just going to go over abalone ecology just a little bit. Uh, they are marine mollusks that are benthic creatures. They are usually found in rocky habitats. Different species are found at different depths. Black abalone are typically pretty high up and then um, the lowest, the deepest ones are the white abalone. And then each species too can, has typically a high a range of, you know, depth they can go up to. Uh, abalone are really important in numerous ways because they are ecosystem engineers, um, because they're keystone species. They feed on kelp and drift kelp and help manage our forest by providing um, more of a dynamic ecosystem. Because when they're a part of the ecosystem, we don't have mono, like just one species come in and take over. It's a part of a food chain, right? Um, uh, this picture I have here is just a little like thing Save California Salmon has developed for kids to talk about food webs. 
you know, uh, but also what I like about this one, it also incorporates not only commercial fisheries, but traditional fisheries as well. Um, so actually let's go back to this a little. You'll see here, um, some of the species I have listed uh, are sea urchins and the sunflower sea star. The reason I've included those in here is you'll hear a lot of talk about them recently where uh, because of warm water events, we functionally on the, on the Humboldt coast are, and south of us, the sunflower sea star because of warm water events is functionally extinct. We had a bunch of warm water events that kept occurring off our coast and would cause um, basically a pandemic of uh, withering, not withering syndrome, I, sea star melting disease. And it was really sad. You'd literally see these sea stars like tearing themselves apart, like arm by arm, and they would just like melt away. And they were the last main predator of the sea urchin which has now that has no longer any main predators because we've gotten rid of the sea otter and we've gotten rid of the sunflower sea star. There are no predators that longer keep the sea urchins in check. So the sea urchins have like essentially, they'll call them like sea urchin barons because there'll literally be nothing but sea urchins on the seafloor because they've annihilated all the kelp and it is drastically affecting our systems and uh, affecting abalone because kelp and drift algae is their main source of food. So, and that brings me to threats facing current populations. The largest threat was definitely overfishing uh, due to your, their unique mating habits. Abalone um, were depleted when uh, commercial fishing industries came in to target them uh, because of their propensity for broadcast spawning and that they don't always have successful spawning events, uh, it's really easy to damage their numbers. Uh, same with overfishing. Uh, it is thought that poaching is one of the biggest threats to abalone right now, especially the more accessible ones like red and black, because black you can literally find um, exposed when there's low tide events or not even that low of water. Now, because there has been such, uh, there's been so many detrimental things that have happened to abalone, including disease, over harvesting, um, and warm water events, we have now have really low densities of abalone. And to in order to have successful spawning events, they have to have high numbers and be in congregation with each other, like pretty close. Otherwise, sperm cannot fertilize the egg. Like I was mentioning, warm water events will kill off abalone and have. There are multiple um, diseases and parasites also threatening them, including um, there's an invasive snail found uh, to affect them, withering syndrome, uh, and there's, uh, I believe, one more. But I can't think of it at the moment, and I do need to keep moving on. So sorry, um, I can answer any questions later. Uh, I will only have a little time to talk about it, but there are some really cool recovery programs actually for abalone as um, the white abalone was the first marine mollusk to be listed as an ESA endangered species. There are mariculture operations for white abalone, pinto abalone and green abalone to reestablish them into the wild. There are also, um, red abalone operations, uh, but to my knowledge, those are mostly like for food consumption. There are recovery plans out there for white abalone, black abalone, red abalone, pink and green. Um, the ones that I could not find any for flat, and I believe that is due to insufficient data supporting um, their populations. I'm going to do a quick shout out here to uh, the White Abalone Restoration Consortium, WARC. They are a really amazing program that I have been following since I started school at Humboldt. 
um, a long time ago. They are having a successful breeding program for white abalone because of overfishing. Essentially, they were pushed to the brink of extinction and scientists discovered a few small populations of them uh, in the later 2000s. And because of observations that the populations were crashing really fast and like huge mortality rates, they took these last few into culture and have been breeding them in a cultured environment. And they've actually had, I think, up to three outplantings of them in Southern California at their test site. And they also send them out to labs across the state uh, and learning places. I think they might even be here today, so shout out. Uh, and then what I just wanna end on is that you can actually report poaching, which is thought to be one of the biggest threats to abalone right now. One of the most interesting examples uh, I've heard of this is that one of my professors who's doing a lot of abalone monitoring uh, went to many sites that were very accessible where abalone populations were historically very dense and sadly was finding that those populations were no longer dense. But something that was really cool that I would like to end on was that there was this one site that I believe was either I believe it was a mill and their coastline was not accessible because they had it fenced off and because it was fenced off and no one was going out there for fishing or recreation or anything there are actually really high numbers of abalone out there even when at the time a lot of them were suffering withering syndrome or quite literally starving to death because they can't find enough kelp uh, but because there was no poaching, there's actually healthy populations in this area. So if you see abalone in the wild, leave them alone. It, there's no open fishing on any abalone season, any abalones right now. And I don't think they're even slated, red abalone I think is slated to open April 1st, 2026. And that's if we stay on track. You know, if things get worse because of anthropogenic climate change, warming waters, poaching, you know, I, I, I don't know what to tell you. And something that abalone are, they are known to native people as cultural keystone species, meaning that if we lose abalone, there will be a ripple effect felt throughout the culture and it could potentially have irreversible damaging effects because abalone is so important to us as a traditional food, a tool source, important for ceremony, regalia, art, both historical, traditionally, and modern. It's, you know, and I, I can't tell you how much I love abalone. It, it's really a great thing. And before I talk all your ears off, I do wanna give time to our amazing presenter next, Shoshone Jensaw Hostler, who I'm sure would be happy to, well, uh, Regina will introduce and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Cody. That was great. Um, and now we have Shoshone Gensal Hostler. She is a Yurok tribal member and descendant from the Kuruk, Talawa, Tutanini, and Yaki peoples. Um, and she is the um, head of the Yurok Suicide Management um and for the Yurok tribe and an associate marriage and family therapist she completed her master's in psychology with the emphasis on on counseling psychology from humboldt state um she is also a regalia maker having created thousands of prayer and contemporary items in the past 17 years being part of dance and participating in ceremony helps her to keep grounded and connected to her community. And this is a part of her life she's very involved in. These connections to family, community, and ceremony make up a huge portion of her life and bring her joy. And she is here to um, share with us about her regalia today and um, abalone. Thank you, Shoshone. Uh I'm very honored to be here first off. So Inakna Shoshone Jansa Hustler. Um, a little bit about myself is, um, as you heard, I've been creating regalia for the past 17 years. I am so close to finishing my 22nd brush dance dress. 
Um, and then um, continuing on um, that work. And um, I think um, first and foremost, I'm so honored to be asked to come here today to talk about abalone and, um, and my perspective on abalone and abalone woman um, as a Yurok woman. And so I really want to preface that um, what I'm sharing are things that have been shared with me um, from the Yurok culture and are no, are, it's, it's not a uh, an exclusive or an exclusive overview of everything to know about um, abalone woman, but it's just merely the things that I've been taught and shared and what I incorporate into um, how I view abalone woman um, from Northern California. And so to start off, I'm going to tell um, a little story and I will say I'm not <laughs> <laughs> a storyteller, but I will tell, uh, share a story with you about um, Abalone Woman. And so um, this story happened a um, long, long time ago. So Numi Nahikon means um, uh, a time so long ago, it's before the um, humans were on earth, but we had the spirits um, were um, in charge of the world. And um, we had Dentillion Man, and he came from a very wealthy, um, respected family. And we had Abalone Woman, and she came from just as uh, much of a respected and well-to-do family a Yurok, from Yurok villages. And so it made sense that they would be married. So they became married, and... Um, you know, Abalone woman, she was beautiful on the inside and the outside. And she had many um, gifts and things that she was good at. And um, she was so nice and she was considerate and respectful. And when she came to live at his village, um, the village people and his family, they would say, oh, Abalone woman, she's so beautiful. Her hair is so nice. And Oh, Abalone woman, she makes such nice baskets. And oh, I really, really like Abalone woman. She's so respectful. She's so, so nice. And oh, Abalone woman makes really great um, acorns. And she cooks really good salmon. And she um, uh, has beautiful dresses. And, um, and that made Dentillion Man, he got bitter. He got upset by hearing, um, he was so used to everyone talking about him from his village and um, what he was like. It was really um, hard for him to hear um, things that centered Apollonia woman. And um, he started off by um, comments about Oh, your basket could um, you could do better here. You your your weave is not not perfect, and um, and she would say okay, and so she would listen, um, but that um, continued to get worse, and um, his criticisms turned into um, verbal abuse, and. Um, that led to, uh, you know, emotional abuse, and um, that continued to um, to be um, physical abuse. And um, he would bruise her body, and um, he would um, make her bleed. And this one time, he was um, becoming physical with her, and she ran. She ran from him. And she ran down to the beach and she was skipping along from the rocks and she's crying and she is bleeding. She had cut her foot running along the rocks. And so you could see where she had skipped along the rocks. Um, there was tears and there was blood. And she gets to this point where She's on this rock and she's by herself. She had outrun him a ways. And she 
crouches down and she's praying and she's praying to find this inner strength, um, you know, that she finds an inner strength to, to help her get out of the situation. And pretty soon, um, Tintillion Man, he catches up to her and he's right about to become physical with her. And she um, rises up and she smashes him down and she breaks him into these little pieces. And um, they separate. And um, if you look at our red abalone, that is um, in our Northern um, California region is where we have our red abalone. When you look at the inside of the shell, it looks um, like what tears look like on rocks, right? It has um, that iridescent um, glow of like all that mixture of colors. Um, and if you turn the shell over, you see that red, that's the red from her um, bloody feet and the inside of the shell is her tears. And so that's where we believe how we got abalone. Um, and so abalone is considered for us up here, for our Yurok people, um, a woman's medicine. And so that's not to say that men can't wear abalone or that it's only for women, but that's to say it represents that balance, right? And so dentillion really, really represents like um, men's medicine, and then you have your woman's medicine. And for us, we don't mix the two. We um, have representations of both, but they have different meanings. Um, and so when, um, when I'm making women's regalia, um, it's really important for me to incorporate abalone because her prayers are different. And um, it's used a lot in our, um, it has a really important role in our flower dance ceremonies, our girls coming of age ceremonies. And in that coming of age ceremony, at the very end of her 10 day ceremony, where she's um, figuring out how she's going to be in the world, who she is um, as a woman, she'll look into the um, abalone shell. And it's for her to see if she can find what her inner strength looks like for her. And um, when I'm making pieces, and so that's why um, we wear um, abalone necklaces during that time, um, during that ceremony. And um, when I'm making pieces that have abalone on it, um, when I, I'm making a conscious choice to include it, right? And, um, and so, so how I kind of view it is like dentillion is, it's a richness, it's our money, it's our traditional money for my tribe. And so that has value. You know, there's a lot of things that come with um, being able to buy and purchase things that you need for your family, for your village. It has a place in ceremony, but it is something that I think of as like a monetary value, you know, an outside value. And I think of abalone as all of those inside things all that inner value, that all of that inner wealth that you want. Um, and so when I incorporate it into um, women's items, I'm, um, well, first I think I, I need to step back a second and say that when I um, create regalia and when you create regalia, um, they're prayer items. And so it's very important that um, you're in a state of mind that's a prayerful state of mind. That, you know, I'm sure um, a lot of us have heard, like, um, think positive thoughts, you know, being a positive mindset. It's about purposely being prayerful. And so um, you need to be in that state of mind because all of your thoughts, all your energies, all of the time and your energy that you're putting into that item is part of that prayer. And that item is used to pray Um and they, the items that you put on there have their own prayer. And so when I'm putting them on things, um, I think about what I want for the girl or what I want for my daughters. Um, so I have three daughters. And I think when I use abalone, what I'm saying is that I want my daughters um, to know their value. I want my daughters to understand that they have their own voice. 
I want my um, daughters to have inner strength, to be able to pray for inner strength. I want um, my daughters to be kind and humble. And, um, and I want my daughters um, to contribute, right? To, to, to contribute their gifts and be um, rich from the inside, right? Um, to be beautiful people on the inside. And also I want them to be um, resilient. I want them to be able to face any challenge that they may have. And also I want them to speak up when somebody is not valuing them as people and to have that strength and uh, uh, to know how to do that. And so that's what I think of when I'm incorporating that into the items is that that's my prayer for whoever is going to wear it. And then that prayer goes up and it gets used and it gets added to, right? And whoever's wearing it adds up their prayers to it. And um, so that's kind of what I think about um, with abalone is I think about abalone woman and I think... Um, I'm speaking just as a Yurok woman, but I think a lot of the tribes around here have a similar view of Abalone and Abalone woman, and she's incorporated into a lot of contemporary art, um, as well as um, as uh, traditional art and regalia. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'd love to end on this because I think it's a great way to do it. Um, again, like what I was saying, education is a great tool for us. Um, learning about abalone and their importance to many different cultures and people and talking about that. Uh, also, you can follow the White Abalone Program. Um, I don't know if they all have a donation um, ability, uh, but I'm sure they'll let us know. Uh, but really, it's what you can do personally is don't take abalone, leave them be. Um, also, be an advocate for them. And uh, yeah, and I think I kind of laid out a lot else. And so I don't want to, you know, keep hitting the same thing over and over. But I would just like to thank everyone for being here. Um, we're really excited about this series that we're kicking off. This is just the start of many that we'll be having. That is a TEK series that is going to be species specific. Our next one is going to be on salmon and we'll be with uh, Jamie Holt, the Yurok biologist. So fishery. On April 1st. On April 1st. At 11 So um, I encourage you all to join. It will be a similar format where we will talk about science, but we'll also talk about um, traditional indigenous science and then also um, culture and meaning. So again, Chikani, um, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Shoshone, for coming. I really appreciate having local voices on these issues. Um, and yeah, Chikani, I'm just filled with joy. Thank you. <laughs>